All right, and welcome back to another episode of Clarissa Explains Everything. Today we're going to take a little bit of a sidestep and move away from the geology, although even looking at this map I can't help myself and start thinking about the plate tectonics in play here. Um, and we're going to look at something biological instead. This was the video, excuse me, that I had always <laughs> intended to make as the first video for the Clarissa Explains Everything, but of course the very second I posted the first video I got a question and that question was about volcanoes and me and volcanoes are really good friends so that was one that I just had to start because I couldn't help myself but this set of slides is waiting and I um, am really passionate about this subject just in general um, and what we're going to be looking at today is the monkey problem and this is like it says in the description one of a four-part series that I'm working on discussing the killing kidnapping torture and trauma for profit of one species of monkey in one part of the world. Keep in mind, anywhere that humans and animals interact, there's going to be conflict and there's going to be situations where the people are probably abusing the animals. So I don't want it to be like singling out a certain location. This just happens to be a problem that I tripped over during the pandemic while hiding from everybody and watching videos on YouTube, right? Um, and at first I was really taken with a lot of these pet channels and rescues and the VOs and stuff. And then I started actually digging in and looking at what was going on. Um, and I feel like the best place that I can help with this is to try and teach um, and help people understand why these people who are taking these animals are some of the most reprehensible people on the planet, regardless of where or why they're doing it. Um, and just how bad this situation is. And then we're going to talk about ways that we can approach, you know, stopping that um, and learn some more about the animals along the way. So we're looking at one particular group of monkeys. This is the macaques, which are an old world primate. They have really, really long fingers and kind of short thumbs. They are medium to small monkeys. There they are down there in the picture at the bottom. Um, so about the size of a medium sized dog is not an unusual body size. They're roughly that size, but they're much meaner <laughs> just in general than my dog has ever been. They are super, super intelligent. They are very adaptable. Um, they teach each other things. They actually have been demonstrated to have legitimate cultures and they, because of all of this, or because of this, at least thrive in big cities. Like they do super well in large communities. They don't do well, like in smaller communities because there just aren't enough places for them to hide. But when you're looking at a large city, there's so much going on that they are able to just find all sorts of things to eat and to, you know, get into, and they're always causing problems. Um, and so because of that, they are considered pests in a lot of places, especially some of the species that we're gonna be looking at. Um, the long tails and the talk macaques in particular, and the Reese's can be really big problems in cities. Different species within the group will spend different amounts of time on the ground or between the trees or even in the water, depending on the species. And what's really kind of neat is you'll find there's a corollary between the length of the tail and the length of time spent in the trees. If they're spending a lot of time climbing and or swimming, they have a longer tail and it's thicker. And if they don't spend much time in the trees, it tends to be shorter, which is kind of cool. And these particular animals are located all throughout the Indo-Pacific. And what I mean by that is everything between the Bay of Bengal and the Philippine Sea. So, you know, starting up as far north as Myanmar and the southern parts of China, moving down through Laos, Thailand, Cambodia, Vietnam. Sometimes, you know, there will be some in Malaysia and Philippines, but most of the action of our story is going to be focused on uh, Cambodia, Vietnam, and Thailand. We're looking at four species in particular in these areas of import, and they are the Reese's macaque, the long tail or crab eating long tail. Boy, we're creative naming these things, aren't we? The uh, pigtail macaque and the stump tail macaques. So there's four pictures of them. They are very interesting animals and very empathizable. This is the Reese's macaque. This is one that most people are really familiar with. Um, in studies, they've been found to be the most aggressive of the four. They tend to be proactive in protecting themselves and their troops. Um, they do not sport any fancy hairstyles. No mohawk. It's not real common. And the adults will sometimes develop a very almost like burned reddish bloody looking face. And it's not anything like 
wrong with them. It's just their skin. <clears throat> and this is the species that's really commonly used in medical research. And when I do part two, we'll actually talk about that a little bit and talk a little bit on why we use animals like these as opposed to, you know, convicted rapists or something. I've heard that as a suggestion or that, you know, you take people on death row and use them for experiments. And there are reasons why we don't besides the moral ones that have to do with it being bad for the science. This little one is making a play face. This is a happy face. They're having fun. It's kind of, a, I always think they look like and act like cats a lot. So it's very similar to a kitten. Oh, I'm going to get you, you know, or a puppy. Here's a couple more pictures of them. This is uh, on the left. It's going to be a mama macaque and her little one, who's probably three, four months old. Um, and then on the right, we have a small family group. We have the oldest female sitting over here, probably her sister or older daughter, and then older juveniles and the new babies of this year. And they tend to hang out in groups as families. The tail is really useful as a leash for the moms, and we'll see that coming back again and again as sort of a recurring theme. The long tails or crab eating long tails, as their name implies, have a very long tail. And if you guess they sometimes eat crab, you'd probably be correct. And here we can see this adult is holding on to this young one by her tail. This particular couple is a really interesting story that we're going to come back to in a little while. But the teaser is that is not her mother. They are less aggressive, the long tails, than the rhesus macaques, but they are still likely to attack if they are threatened. But they're not as proactive at attacking what they perceive as threats. Um, if we leave them alone, they're less likely to mess with us. They're very, very common in a lot of places and almost invasive because, like I said, they really do well in big cities. And when they're, you know, living in big cities, they get into everything because, of course, they do. Um, but they are also vulnerable. Their numbers are declining. Pretty much all of these species are seeing numbers declines across the board because their habitat gets, you know, destroyed and they're not able to live where they would. We are making farmland and now they're pests. They are nicknamed the crab eating longtails for their propensity to eat crab, which is a challenging beastie to catch and eat when you are a terrestrial animal. Just a little bit. Um, and they are, like I said, very smart, observed using tools, eating shellfish after using the tools. Um, we'll see some more pictures of that because it's pretty cool. This is actually one of those pictures I was referring to. And this video is down in the links below. Um, the life of the seaside monkeys. And uh, this one has a rock that he is using. I believe that was, yeah, it's a male. Um, to knock the limpets off of the rocks because they want to eat the limpets but they can't get them off most of the time. Um, they have different rocks that they will use to break open other types of shells. And they actually have favorite types of rocks, just like me, um, for different tasks. Here's a couple more pictures. We have a probably one day old newborn that was taken away from its mother. Um, without question, the mother was killed because that's what they do is they kill the mother because the mother will not give up the babies. They are, as we'll see later, actually really good mums and very, very protective of their babies. Um, so this is one that has been poached by one of the worst, most reprehensible piles of human rubbish um, in the whole game right now. Um, and I regret that I ever was taken in by this joker. Um, on the right, a much more happy family picture. This is a mom with her new baby. And actually she has, I think, two babies in that picture with her so she's probably looking after the child of this adult and she's got one of her older juveniles there with her they hang out together and they groom and eat and just hang out and they sport a really nifty mohawk most long tails have that mohawk that's pretty cool pigtails are by far my favorite of all of the macaques just across the board i love the pigtails they are larger than the Reese's or long tails, comparable in size to the pigtails. Um, and of the group, they are just by far the mellowest. They tend to be pretty chill and are pretty willing to socialize with humans. They will interact with us a lot more readily than the other species, but most of them are semi-humanized, like semi-urbanized um, in the areas that people interact with them. And they are more likely to retreat or be ameliorating to be affiliative than any of the others in the group. They tend to have a reddish coloring overall, whereas the long tails had more of a grayish tone and the rhesus macaques are sort of 
gray and reddish, but it's a little bit mottled. And they have a shorter tail than a lot of the others, as the name implies. Um, they are very striking animals. And this lady here is um, rocking her bihawk. That's a classic pigtail thing. And she really has her eyeliner on point, right? They have just the markings around their eyes. It probably has to do with light reflection, but um, it really does look like they're just wearing fantastically perfect makeup. There are actually two subspecies of pigtails, the southern pigtailed macaque and the northern pigtailed macaque. We're mostly going to be looking at the northern ones, um, which incidentally I think are by far the prettiest. Uh, but it, there are some situations that involve the southern ones that are a bit touchy, but they're not as... You don't see them very much on YouTube for whatever reason. And then the stump tails. And these are the ones that spend the most time on the ground. They have very little tail, as you can see in the picture. They're basically just little nubs. Um, they have that reddish face that looks really alarming, but that's not because they've been injured or anything. That's just the way their skin color is. The babies start out really pale yellow. And they are the treasure of the troop. Like... The males will calm down, everybody will calm down, and let the babies get away with quite a bit. They're really, really precious in the troop. This particular species tends to range a little bit further north in China and Vietnam, both countries that are a bit more rigorous about enforcing their anti-poaching, anti-trafficking laws. Um, but it still is problematic. That one on the bottom left, this little baby right here, has just been rescued by some rangers in China and is going to be taken to a sanctuary. Whoop. Now, because I want this to be like sitting in a classroom in some regards, I'm going to leave in things like me getting a drink of water or me stumbling over a word. I'm not going to edit that stuff out. Uh, and like I said, this particular species does spend a lot of time on the ground foraging all day long. Couple another video that's really great that's worth watching right there down in the links. And we have a juvenile mom baby. And one of the things you'll notice in this picture is that juveniles' cheek pouches are just jammed full. And that's a really common thing I think I've noticed a lot with the stump tails is they are by far the most willing to just pack those cheek pouches full of food. On the right, we have a mother and her daughter who were rescued and released. I, I, my Verdict is still out on that particular channel, so I'm not going to name them yet. There are many, many others. I think 26, but it might actually be more. One in particular that's kind of cool is the lion-maned macaque. And uh, this one is really notorious for a behavior that it engages in, and that's slapping squirrels. Um, and the reason it does this is because it can, the, the lion's maned macaque cannot differentiate an unripe versus a ripe jackfruit. And if it's not ripe, it's you don't want to touch it but the squirrels can. And so the monkeys will watch the squirrels and when the squirrel goes after the jackfruit, they will follow it and then pop it in the face and slap it and slap it and slap it until it goes away. If it doesn't, they'll knock it down out of the tree and then go down and eat it on the ground. The squirrels won't go down on the tree. And I do have to say the squirrel just looks like, what, what are you doing? Like very confused, unhappy little squirrel. Um, others are the Japanese macaque or snow monkey, as they are sometimes called. They live in the mountains in Japan, and they were observed after they saw humans hanging out in the hot springs. They started doing it. And so the people at one resort, I think, actually went and built them their own hot spring, and they just hang out there. There's the golden snub nose, a.k.a., in my mind, the little muppet. <laughs> and the talk macaque, which looks really similar to another one called the bonnet macaque. And the only difference is the bonnet macaque parks his hair down the middle. You know, so it's all about hairstyle. And then the black crested macaque is a really neat looking one. These kind of remind me of gelatos, which are a type of baboon that eat grass on the African plains. If people want to talk baboons, we can go down that route later. They make a lot of facial expressions. And these are animals that are constantly communicating with each other. They convey a variety of things. They, like I said, they have a culture. We're going to look at three specific facial features and then a couple of others as well. The fear grimace, which is, a, which is a, as the name implies, a fear face. This is the expression that they make when they are afraid. It's kind of like if you come home and you're caught your dog getting into something really messy and just like they know they're in trouble and the ears go down and back. 
that's part of the fear grimace. The other part of the fear grimace, as you can see in the photograph, is it looks like a rictus grin. I make the face like you can see me. Um, there is only one animal species known that smiles and it's a happy expression. And that's us. Animals don't smile. When they are showing their teeth, it is not a good thing. Either it's a threat or it's a gesture of submission, depending on how it's done. In this case, it's an, it's fear and submission. They will sometimes stick their tongue in and out. They may switch between the fear grimace and this next one, lip smacking. Although lip smacking as a general rule is a pretty positive, you know, interaction for them, but it can also be an apology. So this can be an apologetic behavior or just expressing peaceful intentions. Hi, I'm nice. I'm friendly. Let's be friends. You know, I don't want to fight. And then the third one that's one of the three major ones is chin up, or as I like to call it, I'm not here. Um, and this, the dog does sometimes too. I'm, I'm not looking at you. You can't get me in trouble if I'm not looking at you. So it's an avoidance behavior most of the time. The other time you see this chin up behavior is with young juvenile males trying to, you know, casually cozy up to some of the girls and like, hey, you want to make a baby? You want to, you want to, you know, that sort of thing. So let's look at a couple of other examples. Here's that fear grimace. I have one um, that's, you know, semi wild. The little girl on the left, we're going to see her a couple of times. She lives at one of the temples and uh, she just had a little brother and she does not like that he is getting to nurse and she is not. And so she's constantly trying to steal milk from her mom. And so she's just been in trouble and been chased away. And so she's out there making that grimace and being like, oh, I'm sorry, please don't beat me up anymore. Um, same sort of thing going on here on the right, except that it's a horrible monster of a pretend human being um, abusing the animal. And the animal is making the same expression. I'm scared. Please stop. I don't know what's going on. Most of the time, they're very confused. Lip smacking. We've got three here. Like I said, this is usually either apologetic or, hey, I'm happy to see you, almost. And the first one, this little guy, and we'll see him quite a bit as well, just saw one of his friends coming up and he's excited and he's, mm, and it kind of does look like they're, they're mooching at you. This little girl is the friend <laughs> that he saw. This is a different moment, though. Um, and she's apologizing because she annoyed his mommy and got, kind of roughed up a little bit. And then the third one is one of the sad ones where there is a human that has been abusing her and she is basically trying to convince them that she's a good girl and that they don't need to keep punishing her for she doesn't understand why they're mad at her. I think she took her clothing off. Monkeys don't wear clothing, so it makes sense. Um, some more examples of chin up or I'm not here. The one on the left is the less stressed of the three, obviously. And she's more of the like, all right, I'm just, I'm, I'm not even looking at you guys because you're being ridiculous. The other three, it's pretty clear that they are looking away and avoiding to try and avoid an unpleasant situation. They are stressed because they should not be pets. Soapbox, gonna go back, talk about that later. Another expression that you see, and it's not really an expression, it's just a combination of little facial features that ex that get combined with those other three. Um, you see that the ears are back, they may be flapping gently, but they're not pulled down, they're not pulled way back. The face is mostly relaxed, you'll see the tongue come out every once in a while, the brow is not down, it's just this very calm, relaxed, and this is called an affiliative expression. So when they're in their normal troop and just hanging around with each other, this is what you expect. Other really blatant expressions, the open mouth stare. This is where they don't like you. They do not like you. Um, and they're going to get aggressive if you don't go away. Sometimes they'll open their mouths or show their teeth. Sometimes they won't show their teeth. They're always opening their mouths. But what's really important is look at the intensity of the stare. They're staring intently. The mouth is partially open. The ears are back, brow is down. They're not happy. This is an unhappy monkey. Um, it's one that they commonly make towards humans they don't want around, but they also will make it. If you watch some of the temple macaque documentaries, you'll see that if two uh, families are facing off, they'll make this expression at each other um, when they're in conflict, when you have two different troops coming together. Here are some more examples. Um, 
little lady on the left with her baby. And another thing you'll notice about that particular female is that she has no canines. And this is because some horrible pile of jerk face took them out when she was a pet. So she couldn't bite. And then they dumped her at the temple and now she cannot protect herself. So she's one of the lower ranking monkeys in the group. And that means she does not get a lot of the good parts which is very sad. She is making an open mouth stare and somewhere in between that and a fear grimace, she goes back and forth in this picture um, because she's being pushed around by the other animals. On the right, we have the little girl with the not her mom who is making that expression at the videographers because they are getting way too close to that baby and he doesn't like it. This is one of the rare occasions where a male is taking care of a baby and he is very, very protective of her. That is his baby and he doesn't like anybody getting close to her. He takes her from her mother in the morning and returns her at night so she's able to nurse still but during the day she stays with him. And a lot of the channels have tried to sort of paint it as a mean relationship that he's abusing her but I don't think that's the case. I think that he just wanted to raise a baby and he loves her and he does his best by her. And then we have one that's currently being abused by a horrible person who is making that expression at the person who's been mistreating him. But, so we're clear, here's my soapbox on this subject. Humans are the only species that smile. If a monkey is showing you their teeth, they are not happy. This is not a smile. Not a smile. It's not a smile! This is fear. This is a fear expression. She's very confused and uncomfortable and afraid because this moron keeps pulling her ears and things. Now, as a rule, macaques are matrilineal. Well, they are just matrilineal. It's not even as a rule. That's just across the board. And what that means is that the offspring inherit their mother's rank within the group. That changes a lot more with the males, less with the females. And the girls will stay with their mother their entire life. The girls always stay in the same troop with their mom. The boys, when they hit puberty, which is, depends on the species, but roughly five years old, are required to disperse and join another troop. And it happens sort of as a gradual thing. They just get pushed further and further to the outside until they go somewhere else because they're not being welcome at home anymore. This is actually, there was a study I saw, and I want to say it was in the Reese's macaques, but I don't know for sure, where they found that if a mother had a female baby, she produced a much thinner, less rich milk because the baby needed to form a really strong bond or needs to form a really strong bond with its mother, with her mother, because they're going to be together their entire lives. The boys would get a much richer milk that was higher in fat so that they could range further away from their mums and socialize more because that was going to be, you know, critical survival skills. So that was kind of a cool study. I have to look that up. It functions to prevent inbreeding. I mean, they're not consciously doing it that way. And sometimes it functions the same way in cats. Um, I saw that with Moochie and her babies. She started pushing the boys away after a while, but not Shadow. And the adult males are going to have their own entirely separate hierarchy from the females. And honestly, they don't interact all that often. They are patriarchal, and there's our boy with his little girl again, and some of the juveniles hanging around. The females typically raise the offspring, and it's very rare for the males to have interactions with them. This one in particular does. Um, and what's sad is he tried to babysit another baby before, and I think he, he did kill it, but I don't think he killed it on purpose. Um... Most of that situation was the VO's fault anyways. Um, and Aros has a, a great video about that that you can watch. But this is a rare situation. Typically, you're only going to see the adult males interacting with the juveniles or the really, you know, not the little babies. They don't typically do that. And the males are busy forming alliances. The dominant male is going to have two or three top allies, and they're the ones in charge. Um, and the function of the males aside from mating, is to patrol the home range and protect the mothers and the babies. And a lot of times they will sort of spread out around the outside edges and the males will even pick favorite trees to hang out in. In some troops, a new alpha male will come in and kill all the newborns to force the moms to, you know, become fertile again. 
but it's not common because the females in a troop can kick out a male, especially if he harms the babies. Um, it's not, again, it's another one of those, it's not terribly common, but it does happen where they will game up, gang up and just throw him out and be like, no, we're done. They determine rank pretty straightforwards in a lot of regards. The alpha male is determined by being big and tough. Um, and through having, you know, a couple of good solid buddies next to him and just beating each other up. So they move up and down the ranks quite a bit. The males can move around and as they get older, as they get sicker, he, you know, a male may fall down the ranks. I saw one video where it was, uh, where was that? I don't remember anymore, but it was an older male who had been the alpha and his two buddies. And whenever the actual alpha was around, he was very submissive. He, you know, on his best behaviors. But when the actual alpha was, was away, he would start acting like he was in charge again. It was really pretty funny. Um, the females inherit their rank from their mothers. So it's a lot more straightforward. And because of that, there's not a lot of movement up and down in the ranks for females, but they do occasionally do it. Um, they can form alliances. They will fight for position, just not as often. Um, and daughters support their mothers, as do juvenile males. But the daughters are far more valuable in this regard because they stay with mom for her whole life. And so you can see a subtle shift over years, depending on births and deaths. So the rank changes a lot more gradually for the females. They are always grooming on each other. I mean, this is sort of a classic trope. Not only is it parasite removal, but it's a free snack since these animals eat a lot of different things, including insects. So ticks, fleas, lice, whatever creepy bugs are in their fur, they get them out and they get them clean. This also reduces the heart rate of all of the animals involved. It's much like people when they hug, you know, you, you skin hunger is a thing. And that can help bring your entire body, you know, down a little bit, make things calmer. It's very obvious, especially if you watch for like five minutes, that they know each other. So they build friendships this way. This is them hanging out and having a chat, basically. The lower ranked macaques will groom on the ones above them, and that helps them increase in rank because they are socializing with somebody higher ranked than themselves. And so they keep doing that. They keep, you know, they can be in a better place. It is used as currency. And this was a really funny story I found um, in a particular troop on years that they only had a couple of babies in the troop, just were fertile years for them. The moms who didn't have any babies that year were very interested in the moms that had babies and so they would groom on them as kind of a bribe, like, hey, I'm being really nice to you, let me babysit, because I want baby time. But if the situation reversed and there were a lot of babies, it would be the other way around. The ones with the babies were grooming on the ones without, because they wanted a babysitter, please give me a break. Thank God. It reduces the likelihood of infanticide, which totally makes sense. I guarantee I'm going to be a much better mom if I'm getting a daily back rub and massage. And the boys think they're clever, so they'll use this as a request to mate as well. Um, it's so much so that the younger juvenile males have to be really careful about who they groom, or they can get into a lot of trouble. And here we have a female pigtail who is asking for a groom from the individual holding the camera. When they eat, now to be clear, they eat constantly. They are snacking all day long. But every once in a while, they'll have kind of a big find or quite commonly, especially when humans are involved, people feeding them. Uh, they may catch a fish. They may knock a jackfruit out of a tree. And then there has to be an order. So the top male and his allies eat first and then the rest of the males. The reason for this, it, makes sense is they're the guardians so they have to eat quickly and get out and go back out right and then the higher ranked females and their offspring and the lower ranked females and the older juveniles are last because obviously they're being pushed out this often results in the lowest rank missing out on more desirable treats that's just kind of the way it goes but they still have a lot of options because and here's our little girl that keeps wanting to nurse even though her mom says no eating a bean pod with her foot they eat fruits, veggies, grains, legumes, insects, shellfish, fish, leaves, grasses, and roots. Basically, anything that doesn't kill them. 
Now, there are a couple of fun stories about some of the macaques and things that they eat. Um, grapes and cucumbers are both things that they like quite a bit. And there was one study that was done where two macaques were placed in cages next to each other. They could see each other. And they were both asked to perform a simple task. It was pick up a rock and put it in this slot. And in the first part of the study, both were given cucumber as a reward. And they were both quite happy with that. The second time they did it, they gave one a cucumber and one a grape. And it literally took one round of testing for the one getting the cucumber to get pissed and start throwing things at the researcher. Specifically the cucumber, because it wanted a grape. They, there is one island, there's an island in Thailand, and it's, some of the pictures are from there, and you can watch the video, it's down in the uh, links, where they are provisioned on a regular basis by a research crew. And what that means is food supplies are dropped off on the beach. Um, wheat is one of the things, sweet potatoes, a couple of other things I can't remember off the top of my head, but they do get some food supplies on this island. And in part, I think they do that so that they'll come down to the beach so the researchers can watch them, but um, wheat grains. So they throw it out in the sand, but nobody wants to eat sand unless you're a dinosaur and you have to have it in your gall, you know, gallstone type thing, not gallstones. I don't remember. It's a term. Gastroliths. That's the one. I knew there was a term for it. See? Um, but so what they would do, what they were observed doing is taking handfuls of wheat and sand together and throwing them in pools of water to rinse the sand off the wheat. And then they could pick the wheat out of the water much more readily. Of course, hunting crab is really complicated for them because, I mean, one, they're quite a bit smaller and two, you know, those things have sharp spiky bits and they'll poke you and they're just not very nice. Um, so that's one that's kind of unique for them. Basically anything that doesn't kill them, they will forage constantly. They will, in fact, even eat things that might kill them. Um, there are some species that eat a type of leaf that has a lot of toxins in them. And to mitigate that, they eat charcoal. It drives the charcoal vendors absolutely crazy. Um, the same troop that has the provisions was provisioned with sweet potatoes one time and they were observed after a while dipping the potato in the ocean in between bites, not just to rinse the salt, the sand off, but to salt it so they can even season their food. And that was a behavior that one figured out and then started teaching its friends, but like the older males were not interested in learning but the younger ones and the females were. And so then the next generation of males started doing it, but not the first one because they're too stubborn. But human foods are problematic and they're problematic for a lot of reasons. They are higher in sugar. We breed, you know, we produce them to be higher in a lot of things that are not necessarily healthy for these animals. And so what happens is if you have a troop that is being fed a lot of human foods, what you will see is they become very unhealthy. They become obese. Um, not going to name any names, but it's very bad for them. Here's one of the macaques eating a sweet potato. And as you can see, just sitting there chilling by the ocean water so we can dip in between bites. Yum, yum. And here's one eating some charcoal, driving the charcoal vendors absolutely up the roof, just off the walls. A couple of other examples of them eating things. We have a mama with her little one who has gotten her hands on a fish we have a little guy that's a pigtail, not a pigtail, stump tail, eating a banana. Lady eating a bug. This one's eating lotus pods, mango, and crab. And one thing I want to note is they're messy eaters. And they don't often eat everything. They'll bite off the peel. They, you know, they're kind of picky in some regards. And that partially that lets the babies sit under mom and eat you know, what she drops so they can learn what's good to eat. Other perks of being the boss, like they, like I said before, the uh, lower ranked macaques are going to groom on the upper ranked macaques. So the upper ranking animals are going to be a lot happier. They're going to be more relaxed. And as a result, they're going to be healthier. Um, amongst the vervets, which are a slightly different group of monkeys that live in South Africa, the higher ranked animals have a higher level of serotonin and in the males that is expressed through their testicles which happen to be very blue and the darker blue the higher their rank in the troop but they're dark blue because they're so high ranked so sort of a rude cycle the higher ranked animals are going to get to mate first obviously and 
if a lower ranked female has a baby and a higher ranked female wants to take that baby, the higher ranked female just does it. And the lower ranked female can't do a lot about it. So, you know, this one right here, we have a nice lady who's just falling asleep, getting a good groom. This guy's trying to be clever. Hey, you want to make a baby? And she's just like, eh, not really. And this poor mama spent the whole day following around. Oh my gosh, give me back my baby. Most of the time it's temporary. Sometimes it's not. And the macaques are all over the place. They live on the ground, they live in the trees, and they are prodigious swimmers, especially the long tails. I've seen a lot of long tails swimming. I haven't seen some of the others as much, but the long tails definitely. Um, they play in the water. They love to get up high and then jump down into it just like people. You can see that here, right? And there's another great video to watch by BBC Earth where this particular group of macaques jumps off of a fountain into a pool. It's quite a dive, actually. Now, growing up as a baby macaque, they have um, a really strong bond with their families. These are very social animals. And here we have that little girl with her new brother. She doesn't like him. Babies cling to mom and nurse for the first three months pretty much exclusively. It's just like human babies. We talk about a fourth trimester. Um, and that's the first three months after the baby is born where you really don't spend a lot of time without holding them. Um, and that's very healthy for them. So... For the first three months, they basically don't touch the ground very often. Mom is constantly holding them to her chest or having them cling to her back if she's running. After that, mom will let them sit underneath her and snack on the scrap she's dropping, but they are still going to continue nursing. They will make a lot of noise, crying, screaming, and geckering, which is where they go, eh, 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 eh. that's a great sound, isn't it, right? Um, this is a distress sound. This is how they get their mom's attention and they're supposed to be picked up. So a lot of the channels that murder the moms and adopt babies spend a lot of time leaving them just lying there on the ground and it's not okay. These babies are supposed to be held and leaving them there and filming it like it's funny. It's not funny. It's abuse. Weaning varies wildly. At minimum, most of them get to nurse up to a year. Because that's the breeding cycle. And so then the next year, a new baby comes along. This little lady really wants to continue nursing. And I've seen some where the mother did not have another child for several years. And he was allowed to nurse for three years. That little bugger got fat, though. Moms are totally susceptible to peer pressure, too. If a low-ranked female is off by herself and she puts her baby down and the baby starts crying and geckering... She may leave it there for a few minutes, up to 20 minutes, where she won't respond. But if she is around higher ranked macaques, that time drops to only a couple of minutes that she will let the baby continue crying because nobody wants to hear it. And so the other moms will beat her up if she doesn't take better care of her baby. So they will force themselves to be pretty good moms. And macaque mothers are actually pretty good moms. They have a infant fatality rate, I want to say, of like 20% which is really low. They don't typically, one of the things that gets said about a lot of the abusers when they're abusing the animals, somebody will be like, well, watch the other channels. You can see that the moms are even meaner to them. And I want to say, no, they're not. And I'll explain why in just a second. So here we have an example of two under a year old babies, one long tail, one pigtail. Um, their moms hang out together and the babies are you know, just being babies. This is the kind of stuff that we see sometimes at the temples where the moms get a bit aggressive with and discipline their babies. And it seems very violent. The thing is, this is not typical behavior for these animals. This is a stressed behavior. The monkeys that you see at the temples are being filmed by the videographers from the time they get up until the time the sun sets. And it's not just a couple of VOs. There are dozens of them and they set up situations to cause trauma and drama for views because it's exciting. They kidnap the babies, obviously, and the VOs are the ones that go in and half the time steal the babies and then sell them to the people running the channels that have them at their homes. So none of it is good and it's not normal for them. And here's what I mean. I really want to exemplify that for you. So this little girl playing in a mud puddle and let's check out how many cameras she has around her. Here's a camera right in her face. Here's a camera right next to her. 
There's another one back here. The jerk making this film that I took this clip from also has a camera. And then just off screen, there are two more cameras. So this little girl is just trying to play and socialize and she is surrounded by people and just constantly pestered. And that makes them a lot more aggressive. They don't behave the way they normally would because they are being pushed by these people using that term loosely. I, they're so bad. <clears throat> so it's not normal. They are good moms most of the time. Um, and they do a lot of babysitting for each other. This particular pigtail is a really sweet lady. Um, she and her son actually got relocated last year, but they were at a temple. And uh, she babysits this long tail baby all the time. All the time. The, I think the long tail thinks that pigtail is actually her mother. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of that that goes on. The females will babysit for each other, obviously. Um, and the younger juvenile females have favorite babies to watch. They will have two or three that they like the most. And those are the ones they're going to try and babysit. More than one adult's going to be watching any given baby. There's usually two or three adults watching out for the baby. And if anything bad happens, the closest one gets to the baby first. And the adults will even try to babysit or adopt unattended babies, even if they're not known to the troop, which is really cool. Um, and this is where the vervet forest is one of those situations. They're um, a different species, obviously. They're vervets, um, as opposed to macaques, but in South Africa. And they do amazing work down there. The link's down below. Um, and you can see how these troops adopt the babies. They want babies. They love babies. So here we have that little girl. She's gotten a bit older and her baby brother and she has pulled him away from mom to give mom a break. Obviously our boy in the bottom right with his baby that he babysits all day long. And then the mama pigtail once again babysitting the long tail girl because that little girl just loves the pigtail. So we're going to finish with a really cute story um, that really exemplifies this whole the adopting the babies thing. Um, langurs are another type of monkey that's closely related. They're common in India. And there was a group, I want to say the BBC, I'm pretty sure that's who did this one, who put out a little doll that looked like one of their young babies or juveniles and put the camera in that to observe them. And the adults were fascinated. And it didn't take long for one of the adults to decide that this baby needed to be taken care of. And she pulled it off of the tree stump and carried it around and held it. She groomed on it. They tried to take care of this. They tried to nurse this baby because they thought they had a baby that needed taken care of. At some point, one of them dropped it and it fell off of a branch, hit the ground, and they went to check on it and it wasn't breathing. It wasn't responding. It hadn't been responding, but now they were pretty sure it was dead. And the whole troop came together. The boss female was checking in on it all of them were gathered around this baby mourning for this baby comforting each other for this baby that they had never seen before and it was just a really sweet i mean it's sad for them because they think there's a dead baby um but it also really highlights their empathy and sweetness like they have such great cultures and they love each other and it's cruel to tear them apart and do what's being done. So we'll talk about that next time because we're going to talk about when humans get involved, exploitation, and why the exploitation happens. Because one of the ways, obviously, we can address the problem is by removing the driver for it, as well as removing the incentive that makes them do it. So we'll talk about that next time. Thanks for listening.